Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Thousands of Afghan evacuees are arriving in Indiana. The state is providing temporary housing and support services before they are resettled in a few weeks. These are the same folks who for decades have assisted and aided us. An Indiana soldier was among 13 U.S. troops killed in a suicide bombing last week at the Kabul airport. When I read the news about the 13, my heart told me that my kid was one of them. Ahead, the family of Marine Corporal Umberto Sanchez joins us to talk about his life and tragic death. Plus, we take a look at Indiana's legal weed, how producers are using hemp to create Delta H THC. Because it does come from a hemp plant, it's categorized as, as part of hemp. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. A thousand refugees from Afghanistan have begun arriving at Camp Atterbury outside Edinburgh. They're among the more than 120,000 Afghans who were evacuated in a frantic two weeks after the country fell to the Taliban last month. It will be the final vetting process for the refugees in the U.S. General Dale Lyles, head of the Indiana National Guard, says the state is bringing resources and personnel from outside Indiana to meet the needs at the camp. I do believe that um, folks will fall in love with Indiana as much as we have. And uh, I hope some of this talent stays close. We're joined on set now by my colleague, Mitch Legan, who has been following this story. Mitch, what's the latest? Yeah, Joe, so as you said, you know, Indiana got its first wave of Afghan evacuees on Thursday. They flew into the Indianapolis International Airport, hopped on a bus and made the, you know, hour or so trips down south to Camp Atterbury. We don't have firm numbers, but Indiana officials had said they were expecting about a thousand people to come through. Camp Atterbury has a space for about double that, 2,500. And so in total, officials are expecting about 5,000 refugees to come through in the next couple weeks. Now, Senator Mike Braun tweeted earlier this week his concerns with the vetting process and keeping Hoosiers safe. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so the head of the Indiana National Guard has said that the kind of perceived safety risk with these people really should all be but eliminated because of the vetting process that they're going through. Um, the people at Camp Atterbury right now, they're going to quarantine for 14 days and they're going to get vetted for the fourth and final time. Um, they had to get security checks just to get on the planes in Afghanistan to get out of there. They got checked again in holding areas in Europe or the Middle East. And then they got checked again when they arrived in the United States and are undergoing that fourth and final security analysis. So the officials say that we know who these people are. There's not reason to be concerned. Um, and so, you know, uh, Columbus Mayor Jim Linup about 20 minutes south, he said, kind of similar to Governor Holcomb, he's hoping these people stick around once they get cleared. We, we have already had uh, employers from uh, some of the industry here in, in Columbus contact us, uh, just making us aware that uh, you know, if there's an opportunity, they would like to talk to these immigrants to see whether or not they could be candidates for uh, a job. Governor Holcomb has stressed this would be a temporary home for these people. How long will they stay? Um, so the, the final vetting process is going to take the next couple weeks, like we kind of talked about. And when people can leave is going to be dependent on their visa status. Uh, those with SIVs or special immigrant visas, they could leave after that 14-day quarantine period, have a family or friend pick them up. That's because they've already been okayed. 
Um, those whose status still isn't as clear, they're going to have to stick around and get that figured out. And once they do, they'll get connected with refugee organizations who will hopefully connect them with family if they've got family in the States. If not, they'll find them a place to live either here in Indiana, elsewhere in the United States. But officials have said after that 14-day quarantine period, they expect people who are at Camp Atterbury to be there for about single-digit weeks. All right, Mitch, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Well, nearly all of Indiana counties are in the higher risk categories for COVID-19 as the late summer spike in cases continues. And after months of COVID deaths slowing to a trickle, the state's daily deaths have begun to climb and this week surpassed 14,000. Still, Governor Eric Holcomb maintains the state is following the right approach and he has no intention of imposing any statewide restrictions. The governor issued a new executive order this week that erases quarantine requirements for students if all children and adults in the school are masking up. It's supposed to be a carrot to encourage schools to require masks, but Holcomb says he's leaving it to local officials to impose any mandates. Fully support it, understand it. It's regrettable that so many of our um, kids are out of the classroom on any given one day. The number of Hoosiers under age 18 who tested positive for COVID-19 increased more than 600 percent from July to August. Cases are surging statewide, and health officials say it's likely to get worse in the coming weeks. Across the state, hospitals are on diversion, and many are also suspending elective surgeries as COVID cases are pushing them to their limits. The current COVID-19 surge has boosted Indiana hospitalizations to about 2,300 patients, double the number of patients from two weeks ago. Holcomb says he worked with hospitals to ensure his new order best supports them. But there's no draconian measures where we're saying um, we're going to suspend um, uh, non-emergency procedures, as an example. The order, which runs through September, mandates hospitals report to the state when they're diverting patients to other facilities. That will help Indiana officials better manage resources statewide. The executive order also ensures to extend prior authorizations for non-emergency procedures being postponed because of the COVID-19 surge. And it makes it easier for advanced practice nurses to provide care across multiple locations around the state. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Holden Napsher. Compliance with Indiana University's vaccine mandate varies widely depending on the campus. The largest uh, student vaccination rates are at the uh, largest campuses in Bloomington and Indianapolis, which are both around 90%. But none of the five other principal regional campuses are higher than 76%, with the lowest at the campuses in Richmond at 65% and Kokomo at 68%. The university faces an ongoing federal court challenge to requiring student vaccinations, although judges reaching to the U.S. Supreme Court refused to block the policy before the fall semester began. Well, one month into the school year, children in the Monroe County Community School Corporation have more to deal with than wearing masks every day. Due to a driver shortage, some are facing longer than normal bus rides or long waits to even get on the bus. Pat Bean has this report. Karen Ficino has three children in the MCCSC school system, all at different schools. One daughter is in the Alps program at University Elementary School, and just getting to and from school has been a daily grind. They will pick her up between about 8.15 and 8.30 in the morning. She's not getting to school until 9.30 every day, a half an hour after school starts. Getting home in a timely fashion has been an even bigger issue. She says it was common for her daughter to get home as late as 5.30 or 5.45 in the evening. I finally called the transportation department and wanted to know where she was, um, and I made them stop the bus and drove to her at Tri-North at 6 p.m. Otherwise, she had four more stops ahead of her. She wouldn't have been home until 6.30 p.m. Picking up kids after school has its own problems, says Beth Bugenhagen, who has one child at Tri-North Middle School and another in the Alps program at university. Even if I wanted to take Ada up at university, um, the line and the number of parents who are trying to pick their kids up is so long that it could be 40 minutes to an hour just to pick your kid up anyway. MCCSC has a web and mobile app called Here Comes the Bus that is supposed to allow parents or guardians to track the location of their child's bus in real time, but parents describe it as finicky at best. It was down for a while and um, then it was up. Uh, we were having some issues with it yesterday. Um, so. 
I'd say it's still very rocky using that to know where the kids are. That's Ashley Pirani. Her children go to Highland Park Elementary, but she says she's not seeing the issues with the buses that other parents are. Buses are running a little late for us compared to what they were supposed to be, um, but not terribly late. Um, well within a manageable time frame for us. I understand that that is not the case for everyone and that there's a lot longer wait times. Bugenhagen is seeing both sides of the issue in her household. The bus for her child at Tri-North runs pretty much on time, but the one for university rarely does. Tuesday, her child didn't get home until a little before 7. Like Ada's bus came home so late last night because she was the third route that that driver had run after for the elementary. So she ran three elementary routes, one after another. Bugenhagen says getting a text message or an email about her child's whereabouts after the school has closed does little good. So they have to figure out how to get that information out. And sending a message at 520 that the bus has left, is, that's already too late. We've already freaked out. MCCSC did not respond to several requests for interviews, but Superintendent Jeff Hoswald briefly addressed parents' concerns during last week's school board meeting. He said the school system is short 14 drivers for existing routes. Right now we're really working hard to be more reliable and that reliability in terms of time so our family know, families know when, um, when the bus is expected and to communicate when there's changes in that. Hoswald says with schools returning to in-person learning this year, the increase in bus riders is playing into the issue. When we have 2,700 additional riders, for example, we have the capacity to, to do that in a way in which our run and route efficiency remains true and so that we can provide the services that many of our families have come to expect. MCCSC is actively trying to hire bus drivers. They can earn between roughly $19 and $22 an hour based on experience. Bacino says she sympathizes with the school system because of its shortage of drivers and staff in general, but worries about the effects on students. How are we expecting kids to like do well in school and thrive and learn when they're literally on the bus for hours every single day? And with learning loss a concern during the pandemic, it's time students can't afford to lose. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Pat Bean. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk, I talked to the mother of a Marine from Logansport, Indiana, who was among those killed in the suicide bombing during the evacuation of Afghanistan. And Delta-8 THC is a slight variation of marijuana, but has similar psycho psychoactive effects and is legally sold in Indiana. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The COVID-19 vaccine is here. It's safe, it's effective, and it's our shot, Hoosiers. To see if you are eligible to receive your vaccination or to get more information, visit OurShot.in.gov or call 211. But remember, for now we need to keep wearing masks, observe social distancing, and follow other protective measures to keep everyone safe. Because it's our shot, Hoosiers. This message sponsored by the Indiana Department of Health and aired in cooperation with this station. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. A Logansport, Indiana soldier was among the 13 U.S. troops killed in a suicide bombing last week in Afghanistan. The mother of Marine Corporal Umberto Sanchez says her son was a troublemaker growing up, even earning the nickname Piranha. But she says he was a happy kid who loved making people laugh. His parents divorced when he was six years old, and his mom told me during a Zoom interview yesterday her son and daughter mean everything. We were together all three. We actually have a tattoo. My first tattoo was with him and my daughter. What did he want to be when he grew up? When he was like 10, 11 years old, he always said he wants to be one of those guys that put gas on your car. And then I hear somebody else saying that he wants to be a cashier at McDonald's. And yeah, that was my kid when he was little. And then in his junior year one day, I shared this story before and I'm not gonna be tired of sharing this. He was taking bad decisions. He was being a teenager, a wild teenager. And people didn't believe in him. But as a mom, I always said, no matter what people say about you, you, I am proud of you. You are my everything and you know, it doesn't matter what you do, I'm gonna be here for you. And one day he shows up after high school uh, was done and he's like, hey mom, do you have something to do about 
around four and I said, no, what do you need? He's like, I, I have an appointment and they need you to go. And I said, appointment, what happened? What did you do? And then he said, I joined the Marines and I am 17 and they need your signature. I know that my kid was gonna do something and be somebody. And I know it was the right way. He was probably not gonna be able to do it by himself. So I was proud since the first day I went at 4 p.m. and I signed those papers. What were your thoughts when you heard um, he was being deployed to Afghanistan and then watching that unfold on, on TV? Just for me to hear the name Afghanistan makes my heart beat really fast. Um, I was praying for my son every day, every day. And I was, every single time that I hear news, I cannot just like go to God and say, please bring my kid back. Not just, not just to lie, but please cover his heart, his mind, because I know there's really bad things going on in there. And even if my kid come back alive, it was gonna be really traumatic for him. As a mom that day, when I read the news about the 13, my heart told me that my kid was one of them. Even when I didn't hear anything from the Marine Corps, my heart was prepared since that day, that morning. Was there opportunities to talk to him while there? And if so, what, what did he talk about? He texted me the 23rd and he, the first message was, Mom, I'm alive. And I just said, thank God. I love you. He was just telling me that he was super tired. He said, Mommy, I didn't sleep for five nights. And he told me, I don't feel good. I am tired. I am sick. My belly hurts. And it was so hard. The last day when they received that notification that they had to evacuate people really fast because of the, the information that they have. And I know that he was probably having those words on his head. My mom told me to save people and that's what I'm gonna do. The family has set up memorial and scholarship fundraisers at Security Federal Bank or through the Cass County Community Foundation or their GoFundMe account. Well, Indiana has long been opposed to legalizing marijuana as surrounding states like Illinois and Michigan have okayed the drug for recreational purposes. State leadership has deferred to the federal government for guidance. But as Mitch Legan reports, Hoosiers have found an alternative by using hemp to create Delta-8 THC. Stimline variety has been Bloomington's staple head shop for decades. But it wasn't until recently that they could offer customers something to smoke. We also sell their uh, waxes and moon rocks, which would be Delta-8 flower wrapped with Delta-8 wax and covered with Delta-8 keef. Stimline is one of many stores across the state that's begun offering Delta-8 THC products. Smoke shops, gas stations, and CBD dispensaries advertise Delta-8 edibles, vape cartridges, and more as legal alternatives to marijuana. It is not quite as potent of a psychoactive as Delta-9. Uh, it's not, you don't have the oh wow factor as I like to call it with the Delta-9. Delta-9 THC is the chemical component of marijuana that gets you high. It's the plant's main psychoactive cannabinoid, but it's not the only one. Delta-8 THC has a slight chemical difference. Users describe it as weed light with less paranoia or anxiety, but it still gets users high. Starting out, 25 milligrams is a good dosage to get going, get your feet wet. Manson and his father say they get people of all ages, not just students, asking about Delta-8. I recommend those for people who are in some serious pain or I have a lot of cancer, uh, cancer patients that come in. After years of falling hemp prices, growers like Devin Crispin discovered CBD oil could be converted to Delta-8. Crispin and his team took about two years to get their process right before they began producing Delta-8 products. They started selling Delta-8 edibles and vape cartridges this spring and are already in 65 stores across the state.
We had our attorneys look into it. Uh, we talked with the Midwest Hemp Council and some of the attorneys and people there just to make sure we could ensure the legality of it. And uh, once we were confident that it was a legal product we could bring to market, then we started to work on gathering the materials, raw materials and the processes to make it happen. Delta 8 advocates point to the 2018 Farm Bill as the legal basis for their products. The bill allowed for the cultivation of hemp and defines it as cannabis plants with Delta 9 THC below three-tenths of a percent. State law allows any part of that plant, including the seeds and all derivatives, extracts, and cannabinoids. They made anything with over 0.3 percent Delta 9 THC and its precursors illegal. The Farm Bill did not exclusively address Delta 8, and because it does come from a hemp plant, it's categorized as, as part of hemp. State officials we reached out to about Delta 8's legality weren't keen on discussing it. The Indiana Prosecuting Attorneys Council declined to be interviewed, as did multiple members of the state legislature. The State Office of Drug Prevention, Treatment and Enforcement referred us to the Indiana State Police, which also declined an interview. The state police said in a statement that Delta 8 could be covered under Indiana's Controlled Substance Act. It's a gray area. The state senators and state representatives that I've talked to which there are several, have all, they, they're all arguing, trying to figure out the best avenue to go down. The Mansons say that gray area and lack of regulation could create some safety concerns. They vet the companies they work with and only carry what they consider reputable brands. There's a lot of fly-by-night Delta 8 manufacturers out there. Some of it's really not even Delta 8. Crispin says his vapes are derived solely from hemp plants without cutting agents, chemicals, or metals, and he sends them to a third party to test for safety and compliance. We would love it if there was a, a clear, you know, standard operating procedure for what they wanted. It only really gets rid of the bad actors and makes sure that everything that the consumers get is safe and tested. Advocates say cracking down on Delta 8 would prevent people from getting the relief they need and constrict a potential gold mine. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. The Indiana football team opens the 2021 season Saturday in Iowa. The Hoosiers enter the new year ranked number 17 in the nation and with expectations higher than ever. Pat Bean reports. The 2020 IU football season was upended in many ways by the pandemic. The Hoosiers played just seven regular season games and had the old oak and bucket game against Purdue postponed, then canceled. But the team ended its season where coach Tom Allen expected with a second straight bowl appearance. We you know, came here with a, a vision to, to be able to change the expectations to create belief. And uh, that process is ongoing, and so yeah, we're embracing it. It's a far cry from the past when the Hoosiers were almost an afterthought in the college football world. Before 2019, Indiana had not been ranked in the top 25 for 25 years. In the past, those distractions have been negative distractions. People telling you what you can't do and judging you based on your past. And, and then now you have to be able to block out the, the positive distractions. One possible distraction coming into the season was the health of quarterback Michael Penix. The junior lefty missed the season finale and the bowl game last year after tearing an ACL in his right knee against Maryland. It was the third straight season Penix had cut short by injury but he says he's good to go this year. You know, I'm 100% confident, you know, that I'm, I'm going to have a great season this year. Um, as far as, like, you know, um, all the injuries and stuff, you know, I'm not really worried about that. You know, I just want to go out and play football. Penix will have his favorite target back from last year, All-American Ty Freifogel, the Big Ten's receiver of the year. Freifogel flirted with the NFL draft, but in the end chose to return for his senior season. Allen says he's been impressed with Breifogel's focus. And I've seen guys come back and, and they're worried about getting hurt and they're worried about this and they're trying to, they start pressing because they want to make more plays and they have a little bit different um, approach to practice, you know, and, and I just, man, I never sensed that from him. And it was just, it was full speed ahead every practice. The Hoosier backfield will be led by USC graduate transfer Stephen Carr, who rushed for more than 1,300 yards in four seasons as a Trojan. He's one of several grad transfers that could make a big impact for the Hoosiers this year. Like the offense, the Hoosier defense returns nearly every starter from last year's unit, which led the Big Ten in interceptions, was second in sacks, and fourth in points allowed per game. Forcing takeaways is something Allen emphasizes every day in practice. The DNA on defense is takeaways, tackling and effort, and takeaways is the very first one. It's been that way since I've been here, and I believe in that. All-American cornerback Taiwan Mullen leads the way in that category. He had three of the team's seven interceptions and forced a fumble last season. Mullen is looking forward to another big year in Bloomington. You know, we're going we're gonna to attack this season. 
like never before. You know, we're really excited for it and what's ahead. And, you know, it's going to be a special journey for the Indiana Hoosiers. And after a month of practice, that journey finally begins this weekend. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Pat Bean. Indiana's first home game is at 7 p.m. next Saturday against Idaho. The Buskirk Chumley Theater is requiring all patrons to either get vaccinated for COVID-19 or produce a negative test to attend events this fall. The theater is the first large venue in Bloomington to implement such restrictions. The requirements apply to anyone older than 12 years old. All children younger than 12 will need to have a negative COVID-19 test. The policy mirrors one the Indianapolis Symphony announced last week. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu and by WTIU members. Thank you.